Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ number 30, the knife series where I answer all your questions whether they're sharp or dull. Going to talk about some of our favorite American flippers today, best ways to sharpen serrated edges, and a whole lot more. Let's get into it. All right, well, in honor of our 30th episode, it feels good to, uh, to hit a bit of a milestone there. So we thought we could do with a new intro graphic. Thomas over there channeled his uh, inner Monty Python and I think it came out pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Let us know what you guys think of it there. I think it's pretty funny. Um, but anyway, before we get into the first question, as always, if you want a chance to get one of your own questions answered, make sure to just leave it in the comments section below and come through there, come up with some, uh, some cool stuff to talk about uh, that you guys generate. It's always a, a fun adventure when I, when I read through the stuff. Uh, but let's get into the first one today. It comes to us from Toby King. Hi, David. I, I a big fan of your videos. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, I look forward to watching every week. My favorite knife is the Giant Mouse Ace Biblio. Got one right here. Uh, I love the blade geometry, materials, and ergonomics. Been looking for something a little bigger for certain tasks. How would you compare the Para 3 to the Biblio? Would you say it's a good choice when moving up? If not, other suggestions. Sure. I've got, uh, this is one of the more expensive Giant Mouse Ace Biblios here. The titanium version comes in about 235. Um, personally, I don't know which one I like better. I, I kind of like the, uh, the Micarta versions that have a bit of contour to the handle, but the way these titanium versions sit nice and flat is kind of nice too. Uh, but they're really cool knives, obviously designed uh, by Jesper Vaknez and Jens Anso in collaboration for this brand. You got uh, M390 steel here, just under three inches titanium handle, but you've also got a wire pocket clip on there and that is reversible. Looks nice and classy. Liner lock, ball bearings, good flipping action overall. And, and you were spot on. The, the cutting geometry on these is very nice indeed. Now, when you compare that to something like the Para 3, here's one of the standard versions, starts a little bit under 150 right now. Uh, the main difference between these is going to be in, in the handle itself. You obviously, or you definitely have a bit more to hold on to on that pair of three. And as such, it's going to make it feel a bit like a bigger knife. However, when you get to the actual edge itself, you're not really gaining an appreciable amount over the giant mouse. So while I, I think it's an awesome knife, it's one of, you know, up there in, in my top 10 for sure. That could be a good idea for a future video. Yeah, it's going to be, that down. it's going to be very political. <laughs> um, where was I? Good knife, the Para 3. Um, but it, yeah, if, if you're looking for something for bigger tasks, this the Para 3 kind of gets you halfway there. You've got that larger handle to hold on to. You still have great cutting geometry, uh, maybe slightly less efficient, maybe not than the, uh, the Giant Mouse. It's hard to tell exactly. Uh, we do have slightly thicker blade stock, but it is a full flat grind uh, as opposed to an almost full flat grind on the Giant Mouse. Yeah, probably splitting hairs there. Um, so the cutting experience itself isn't probably going to be that much different. Uh, if you want something that has more handle and a bigger blade, I actually think the Steel Will Nutcracker might make an interesting choice for you there. Um, obviously, stylistically, there's a lot of similarity, similarities between these two. Uh, the Nutcracker starts at about 110 also, so it's, it's a little bit more affordable than that Spyderco. We've got G10 for the handles on this steel wheel. So especially if you're uh, rocking one of the uh, Micarta versions, this is gonna have kind of a similar feel thanks to the contouring that's going on here. Uh, blade length, we're at about 3.4. We've got N690 stainless steel here. Definitely not as premium. It's not a particle steel like either of the, uh, the two we just looked at. And the cutting geometry itself is gonna be a little stouter, a little, a little bit less slicey in favor of a little bit more brute strength. We've got slightly thicker steel, but we still have an almost full flat grind. So for most things, if you're if you really find that you need a bigger blade for a thing, you're probably not going to be set back too much by the thicker blade stock here. In fact, it could come in very much uh, as a positive effect. It also operates a little more similarly to that giant mouse in that we've got a flipper and ball bearings in the pivot, as opposed to the manual opening compression lock on the Spyderco. And it's just got some very, uh, very similar classy looking lines. Now there's not too many options in the Nutcracker range right now. Um, there's a couple different G10s. 
uh, and you can get them, uh, the two other colors, there's a blue and kind of an OD green, those come with a black stone washed finish, or you got the black and the, uh, the satin finish right here. But uh, yeah, if, you're, if you see this, let me know what you think of that suggestion. All right, next question comes from Juan Burgos II. Uh, I already carry a Leatherman Wave Plus with me every day at work. I do apartment maintenance. What do you think would be a good companion knife to that? Okay, cool. Um, now I'm not quite sure um, what uh, what your some of your needs might be in terms of ap apartment maintenance. Um, so I, I made a, a couple of, of assumptions here as we go, um, but really the sky is kind of the limit. Um, there's broad range of, of EDC options out there. So what I focused on was, I'm very familiar with the Wave. I've carried one uh, regularly for many years. And one thing about it, it's, it's a fantastically handy tool. You've got tons of options here, a lot of capability. But for me anyway, if I'm using the main blade on that Wave, and you can see this one's rather clumsily convexed. Uh, this was back in my earlier days, did it with a Dremel flap wheel, I think. How dare you? Yeah, what are you gonna do? But the, the thing with doing uh, main cutting with the blade on the Leatherman is you've got steel handles here and there's a lot of weight in your palm. So if you're just you know, straight ahead powering through cuts, it's not that big a deal. But for anything that might require a little bit more dexterity, a little bit more precision, you're kind of fighting the weight of the handle a little bit. It's certainly doable, but if you're gonna carry another knife as a complement, I would kind of look for something that is a bit more agile to that. And because if you're you know, a maintenance worker in an, in an apartment, you probably have other stuff you have to carry with you all the time as well. I wouldn't want it to weigh too much either. Um, so I actually have something here, the Cold Steel Air Light. Uh, these come in about 85 bucks right now. And the Tonto profile uh, on this might come in handy. Uh, it's different than the two blades that come on the Wave. So you're adding another you know, blade shape, another type of geometry to your everyday kit. And if you ever have to do any type of scraping tasks where you might need a sharp edge, this could come in handy for you. Blade length on these, about three and a half inches. We've got Aus 10 stainless, good solid performer at that price range for sure. And a nice finish overall. We've got contrasting directions of satin grain. Looks quite nice. G10 handles, fairly thin, so it doesn't take up too much bulk or it doesn't uh, put too much bulk in your pocket or if you're wearing it on a tool belt. Uh, and also the weight on these, it's not a feather weight, but it's just over three ounces. So not a lot, uh, not a lot to schlep around. But then on top of that, you've also got Cold Steel's Triad Lock, which is nice and strong, easily used with either hand if you're uh, you know, working with something in your, your dominant hand, if you're right-handed and need to uh, open it or close it with the left, still no problem there. Just a solid all around affordable workhorse. And then when you combine that with all of the versatility you've got with that Leatherman Wave, definitely a lot of stuff you could get done with this combo. All right, next question comes from Nathan Odell. Uh, hey, DCA question. I guess that's my name, DCA question. That is, yeah. Um, hey, Nathan, We're how are you? business cards with that on it. How do you sharpen serrated knives? Can you use a whetstone or is there a special sharpening tool you have to have? Cool, um, yeah, this is, um, it might be more than, than I should go over in a uh, shorter knife AQ, but we'll, we'll go at it anyway. Um, the thing with serrations is obviously they're, the, the best way to do it, it's gonna take a little bit more time than sharpening just a straight edge because if you wanna maintain the sharp serrated points on a knife, um, it's funny I'm holding this knife up because it comes with uh, flattened serrations by design. But if you wanna maintain the crisp definitions, the best way to do it is to find uh, usually a ceramic rod with a radius that lets you get in to that uh, serrated portion. And the problem with that though is it can be very difficult to tell what the right size is. And every knife out there from different, or every company out there is probably gonna have a different serration pattern. So what may work on one might not always work on the other. Um, there might be a little bit of trial and error th there to get to what you need. But um, a workaround to that is to get something that has a triangular sharpening rod. Uh, think of stuff like the Spyderco Sharp Maker has a typical triangular rod there. And when you have these, you can actually run the knife just like you normally would down the sharpening stone because the, on the, uh, the apex there, and it'll get into those serrated edges and do what you need. The downside of that though, is you are gonna round off some points after a while. 
could be a good or bad thing depending on what you're going for. Um, but that's certainly an option. Uh, the Sharp Maker is great for it. Uh, you can also find stuff like Lansky's Dogbone series of sharpeners that, uh, that you know, they make versions that are triangular so you can get in there. Some of them even, if you're careful with it and the serrations are close enough in size, you can actually get in there and do some individual serrations with these rather than going across the whole edge. And the concepts are gonna be just the same as sharpening a plain edge. You work up your burr, um, but a lot of the, a lot of serrations won't be ground on the backside. So it'll be, instead of sharpening the same angle on the backside, it might just be a little bit of burr removal. Again, it's gonna depend on the particular knife in question. Now, one thing to watch out for is, I'll show a, uh, a cold steel here, rather than that SE3 here for a second. Uh, the cold steel has two distinct kind of patterns in its serration pattern. They've got a single larger serration and a bunch of smaller serrations. Now, usually, and I say usually, I'll get to this in a minute, these micro serrations, if you have, uh, you'll see this a lot of times on less expensive kitchen knives where they'll have this micro serration the whole way across, almost impossible to sharpen those well. Uh, you're almost better off at that point, you know, getting something like the, uh, the work sharp electric sharpener, grinding through those and making it a plain edge. On the cold steel, however, because they have a consistent shape, we'll go back to Lansky again, they've got a version of their dog bone that has a, uh, a triple grooved section or how many is that in there? One, two, yep, three. Um, that matches up the dimensions of those micro serrations on the cold steel. So you can get in there and do what you need on those. And best part is those guys, uh, these Lanskis are not expensive. They're only about 10 bucks a piece. Easy to throw in a keychain or a pack and take with you. All right, next question is from Jordan Martinez. He says, Hey DCA, I have kind of a tall order, but do you think you can point me towards some American made knives that run on a ball bearing pivot that aren't terribly expensive? Uh, also the Gerber fastball is a bit small for my taste, so not that one, <laughs> thanks. Uh, sure, no problem. Uh, I've got two really nice knives here and both of them are less expensive uh, than that fastball even. Uh, first off, uh, I actually showed both of these knives together in a video a couple weeks ago uh, in answering a question about uh, good and bad detents. Or, or examples of different types of detents. So I probably should have answered this question at the same time, but say la vie. Yeah, uh, it's already posted. I'll answer it now anyway. <laughs> um, first one, the Buck Sprint Flippers. These are about 50 bucks for the base versions, uh, over 100 for some of the upgraded versions, which have better handle materials. I shouldn't say better, more premium <laughs> handle materials and uh, upgraded blade steels as well. Uh, and these guys are pretty nice, about three and a quarter inch on the blade. So just a little bit longer than the fastballs blade you mentioned, but the whole knife, uh, because of the dimensions overall, feels a little bit larger. It doesn't feel as small as that fastball. Now these base models have 420 HC steel and ball bearing flipper. And the detent on these is a little bit softer than a lot of people are maybe accustomed to. Uh, certainly a little bit softer than a lot of uh, companies tend to do. It's just a different feel. There's nothing wrong with the way they do it on the sprint. I just want to put that out there because some people think the way they do it is bad. Wholeheartedly disagree. It's just a different feel. You get a very smooth flipping action as a result. Much better than, uh, for, for instance, the Buck Vantage series, which is notorious for having a little bit more of a finicky flipping action. These guys are pretty nice. On the opposite side of the feel spectrum, we've got the Kershaw Bare Knuckle. And honestly, this is one of my favorite knives that Kershaw makes across the board. I think it's one of the best in their lineup. And even, I, I include the base model in that, and that's this guy here coming in about 77 bucks. The blade steel is 14C28N, about three and a half inches. Really cool modified Warncliffe shape with a stonewashed finish. You've got aluminum handles and the sub frame lock there on the back and KVT ball bearings in the pivot. Now these definitely have, uh, speaking of reputations like, uh, like the Buck Vantage, these guys have something of a reputation for being a little bit stiff out of the box. It's a little hit or miss. This one's actually feels really good, really nice and broken in, but sometimes they do require a little bit of breaking in before they're, uh, they're really comfortable, but they have all always had just a super crisp, super satisfying and rapid fast action. Um, yeah, in answer to your, to your question, I really can't recommend this knife enough. It's awesome. All right, next question comes from Will Echo. 
Hola, David, heart of the show. Always been a folder guy, but you're so passionate about fixed blades that I'm intrigued. So here's my question. Can you recommend a fixed blade that's tactical but discreet, EDC worthy for folder tasks, and lastly, as an outdoor user? All in one, not a blade steel snob, but under 200. P.S. I have a medium sized hand. Sure thing. Um, one thing I wish I could show you, but I wasn't able to find one today is a White River backpacker. Um, we'll see if Thomas can find some, uh, some old school footage from a previous video. These things are great. Made in the USA, about a hundred bucks, give or take a little, uh, with S35 VN steel. So even if you're not a steel snob, it's still nice to have some, uh, some really nice steel like that. And it's got a, a blade shape that's just about perfect for everyday carry, the outdoor stuff and the tactical stuff even, uh, especially if you go with one of the black coated versions. But I couldn't find one today. So I'll show you something else. Um, let me direct you to the Spyderco Street Beat. Now these are nice and unobtrusive. You said you wanted discreet. This all blacked out look is, uh, you know, obviously you don't have to deal too much with reflections or anything that's too flashy. Uh, and the price on these comes in about 115 right now. We've got a clip point blade with VG10 steel, about three and a half inches. Definitely a very good piercing profile, but a good daily carry profile. You've got that full flat grind, and overall it's an agile handling knife too. It's gonna to be great for your daily tasks like opening boxes or packages, breaking stuff down, slicing up string, whatever you need to do. Solid, solid EDC option. And the handle's quite nice. I do have slightly larger than average hands and I hang off the back just a little bit, but because it's rounded, I still have plenty of plenty of length there to grab onto. It doesn't feel like I'm slipping off. So your medium sized hand should fit in here quite nicely. Back to the, uh, the unobtrusiveness of it. We do have nice positive retention from the sheath there. It comes with Spyderco's J-Clip. So you could use this in, or mount this in a number of different ways. These things are great carried inside the waistband very unobtrusive for, uh, for your desires there. It can also work clipped to a belt or even clipped to a pocket. And then with the, uh, the whole patterns here, it'd be real easy to swap this out for something like a Mummert titanium pocket clip or an Ulti clip if you wanted to carry it actually in your pocket. It's always a good option too. And then one of the other things I really appreciate about the, the sheath design in conjunction with this knife is when you grab the knife to draw it, you don't have to readjust your grip at all pull it out, your index finger is already right there in the prominent finger groove right there because the sheath allows you to grab it like so. So when you pull it out, you're ready to rock. And then of course, your last but not least scenario, this is certainly gonna work pretty darn well as a small outdoors knife as well. Be a pretty good hunting profile, pretty decent actually with that clip point, you got enough belly there to do it. It's gonna be a fine little whittler and be great around camp as well. Now, one other possible option uh, that's a little bit larger, um, this is kind of the, uh, the dark horse recommendation, something like that SE3 might not be a bad thing. Um, the reason I say that is they're fairly slim in the handle construction with these flat micarta scales here. And as such, when you take it with the, uh, the flattened sheath right there, this carries really well inside the waistband, especially uh, like smaller back carry. I've actually done it a few times um, just seeing if I could in my younger days and no problems really getting in and out of cars. It's going to work quite well. And you'll have a design here that fit, fits all the, all the criteria. It's a, it's a knife designed for military folks in survival scenarios to kind of really simplify Essie's story into something that's not entirely accurate, but gets the point across. Um, so you're going to be able to pull off tactical and survival quote unquote outdoor stuff and nice cutting profile with a thin enough steel and full flat grind for EDC uses. You've even got the, uh, the apex there on the pommel. So a little bit larger, but could be another option for you. Um, these guys come in a bit over a hundred. This one right here uh, with the sheath that this one comes with is about 125. Uh, and there is an S35 VN version for a little bit more, but you do get a little bit more girth, a little bit more contouring and width on the handle scales. In any other case, I would absolutely go for that. But if you're going for easier to carry unobtrusively, it's one, one situation where those flat scales might be handier. All right, next up is from Don Davis. He says, hey man, which brand between $100 and $200 has the best or most consistent edge? It seems that most brands can't get their edges equal. Sure, um, so I will say that uh, even in that price range, even the best of companies can have an off day or, or one knife that, you know, it's a little bit off uh, where the edge might be not perfectly centered. 
Um, you know, we're, we're not talking like three, four, five hundred dollar mid techs or even more expensive customs where you really pay for that edge consistency. Unfortunately, it's just a rule of uh, economics of scale, even in the hundred to two hundred dollar price range. It's you're, you're not always guaranteed a perfectly even edge for the most part. It's not a big deal, if, especially if you're a user of the knives, but I can understand why it would be a little frustrating. Um, so with that caveat out of the way, I will say that in terms of the most consistent and, and most well-produced factory edges out there, I have got to go with Hogue knives. They just do a truly fantastic job. Even on a very thin blade, like on this Hogue Deca, starts about 140, you've got a very consistent uh, and even edge overall. They're razor sharp out of the box and highly refined. It's not a toothy edge at all. Contrast to something like, you know, that Buck Vantage or that Buck uh, Sprint, even the, uh, the $100 plus knives that they put out in this series kind of have a bit of a toothy edge, especially when you compare to that Hogue. They're just super well done. Uh, and for years now, that's always been my answer for the best factory edges out there. And it goes not just for the sharpness, but for their evenness and consistency as well. All right, last question comes from Mark Viano. He says, I live on a houseboat and would like to know what you would suggest as the best possible folder, preferably under four inches, less than four ounces and waterproof for fending off killer whales. They're pesky critters and they simply won't leave me alone. Um, actually, I do have an option for you, but forget about the folder. What you want is a fixed blade. You want the Topps Hoffman Harpoon, after all. This is exactly what you're looking for for your scenario. It's about 75 bucks. It is a carbon steel and it is a fixed blade, uh, but it is under, uh, you know, it's about 2.7 ounces by itself. So we, at least we hit your weight, you know, your weight requirement. Um, but yeah, that's exactly, I mean, this is a time proven tool for that type of job. And in addition to that, you can use it uh, just for a, uh, a backup survival knife as well. You've got all that paracord on there. You've got a nice sheath that it slots into can opener, mesh metal. I think it's mesh metal, but a fire starter, survival whistle, everything you need. So tops Hoffman harpoon. That's the guy. Um, I think we just got away with a whaling joke. All right, Captain Ahab. Cool. Well, that's all I got time for today, folks. Uh, as always, thanks for sticking around. And if you want a chance to get one of your questions answered in a future installment of this video, make sure to leave them in the comments below. If you want to get your hands on any of these knives or sharpeners, we'll leave links in the description. And as always, make sure you sign up for our knife rewards program, because if you're going to spend some money on one of these knives, you might as well earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center signing off. See you next time.